Gott und herzlich willkommen zu Grenzenlos. Land of the Unexpected is how Papua New Guinea advertises itself on the posters in the arrivals hall of the airport. In den Ankunftshallen des Flughafens. Doch Touristen gibt es noch kaum in But there are still hardly any tourists in this strange land at the other end of the world. That's where today's broadcast leads us. We'd like to show you what the second largest island in the world has to do with a nun who never left Europe. It was Sister Josepha, co-founder of the Holy Spirit Sisters, who in 1899 sent four young women to what is today Papua New Guinea, a bold leap into the unknown. Without knowing what awaited them, they set out on the voyage. All that was certain was that they would never be coming home. Dass sie nicht mehr nach Hause zurückkehren werden. Die Ankunft der Ordensfrauen in Neuguinea. The arrival of the nuns in New Guinea was the start of a commitment, which was to change this country. A few weeks ago, 100 years after the nuns set up their center in Alexishafen, we followed their trail to see what has become of the first beginnings. The sound of wood banging on wood announces if danger threatens. A festival is being celebrated, or if somebody has died. Communication in an area where there's no electricity and no roads. We are in Timbunke, a village on the river Sepik, one of the great waterways of Papua New Guinea. For centuries, the people here have built their houses on stilts. Again and again, the flooding of the Sepik turns the village into an area of lakes. The river feeds them. Around their houses or on the other side of the river, they've laid out gardens. No one here has to go hungry. The country is fertile. Bananas, sweet potatoes and manjoka grow here all year round. Every family has a boat here. It takes three to six weeks for a man to hollow out a trunk with an axe sufficiently for it to float. The children here, so they told us, with a smile, learn to paddle before they learn to walk. In the middle of the village is the spirit house. Only men are allowed to enter. This is where the masks are kept. Here, the ancestors are especially near. <laughs> For our arrival, they've adorned themselves with everything the jungle has to offer. They dance to greet us, a sign of how much they hold the guests in high regard. The whole village has come together and everyone moves to the rhythm of the dancers. When the missionaries came here more than 70 years ago, they didn't try to destroy the old traditions. And so the dance today is a normal part of even church festivals. The village priest, a missionary of the Divine Word from Paraguay, is obviously enjoying his people's dance. Together with three other members of the order, he lives in the presbytery. But most of the time they're on the road to some other village several days travel away. For him, too, the dance has become a tune of welcome. It's only a few hours ago that this little Papuan came into the world, and Sister Dorota is checking just to see everything's okay. The nun runs a small hospital at one end of the village, and there she's had to get used to several things. It will be not admitted only the sick one, but the whole family will come together. So, for example, I had one mother who was uh, very anemic, she was pregnant, but she was not yet ready for delivery, she was only 30 weeks. So the husband with the nine children, she had nine children, came with her. So the nine people with the husband, the whole family was occupying the one bed to waiting for the delivery of the mother. 
Even if the hospital kitchen looks modest, it still has to feed everyone. The hospital has 35 beds, but most of the time well over 100 people spend the night here. Fortunately, with sago, a starch made from palm pith, a little goes a long way. And when Sister Agnes stirs a little of the thickener into a soup, then normally everyone has enough to eat. It's not just in the kitchen that improvisation and versatility are called for. Many times the nurses were trained only as a nurse, but when they come to the health center like here, there is not a matter of to be a nurse. You have to look after the supply, you have to look after the maintenance, you have to look after the battery, you have to look after the medical supply, fuel supply, organize all the uh, in-service for the staff. Fulfill in order to run the health center is not only to be a nurse. The Polish nun has been in Papua New Guinea for 21 years, for the last seven here on the Sepik. There are many things about the people that she still can't understand. Sometimes the people die on the road. They don't want to move out of the place because when they die on the road, the people, the lines where the area where they die, they will ask for compensation because she will die or he on this place where it doesn't belong to the clan where they are from. So many times when the mothers are laboring and need to be transferred, they just don't do anything and they don't give help to them because they don't find any meaning to come out. So them let them do. So we have very high maternal death in our area. Together with almost 90 other nuns all over the country, the Polish sister belongs to the Order of the Holy Spirit Missionary Sisters. When, in 1896, Arnold Janssen sent the first missionaries to what were at the time the German colonies, it quickly became clear to the monks and priests that they would get hardly any access to women and children. They asked for support from the related female order. Four nuns started with setting up schools and medical aid stations. In many areas, like here on the Sepik, they're still the only ones doing that. This girl has malaria. If she'd got medical aid in time, she would still have a chance. And she developed cerebral malaria, now she finishes epilepsy, she will never recover. She's 19 years old and her whole life is finished because she was not treated properly, no one gave her help. So malaria is the main cause and another sickness, what is very common here, we have TB, tuberculosis. Sometimes all the villages is infected with the tuberculosis. Many times we have not enough medicine for tuberculosis. So we always call the sister in the mountain and they spare us something and send down when we are short with medicine. There are no doctors here. Together with the staff nurses, Sister Dorota is forced to treat even the most serious of injuries and diseases herself. Often she's at the very limits of what's humanly possible. Many times when it's very difficult and then you just call, I said, Lord, I cannot. And in the eyes of people and in the eyes of, of normal, like medical sight, it's impossible to, to keep survive the person with two grams of blood or something. And, and I said, Lord, I cannot do it, but I am doing because you called me and you told me to now to help and do it. And the person survived. And, it's, and then it's giving me the really feeling of touching the Lord, touching and using me to help this person. And this something is giving me the push to continue, to be and continue because my presence have the meaning that someone is behind me and wanted me to do it this. Every morning, the nuns and priests from the Sepik gather for a service of worship. Very rarely are they all together the same time as they are today. 
The priests are often travelling for anything up to six weeks, visiting the many daughter churches of the parish. On their way back, they often bring the seriously ill with them, so they can be looked after by the nuns. The daily masses, but also individual prayer, are inseparably woven into the lives of the nuns. Time to gather strength, time to lay all concerns before him who himself has gone through the worst of human darkness. Five women belong to Sister Dorota's community. A postulate, two local nuns, and since a few months ago, Sister Monica from Germany. Setting off early in the morning, the speedboat takes hours to get down the sepik to the medical station in the jungle. There's still time for rest before an almost endless day begins. Monica spent a year in Latin America as a short service missionary, an experience which changed her life. At that time I wasn't thinking of ever joining the order. I was in a long-term relationship so that didn't come into it. It was more the interest in going abroad with an organisation. But after that year it never let me go. Experiencing how prayer can make the workload easier to bear, that just grabbed me and wouldn't let me go. And so six years later, I then took the leap and joined. branches of the sepik are getting narrower and narrower. What seems at first to be a fascinating carpet of flowers soon becomes a thick tangle of plants where the boat has to fight its way forward. As soon as the engine stops, so does the cooling effect of the airstream. There's no longer anything to protect you from the unbearable humidity and the scorching heat. But the temperature and the mosquitoes are just one hassle. Every clinic when we go, we will always uh, meet with some crocodiles, bigger, smaller, some they have five meters, seven meters, some three meters, different size and different color, but they are always there and you could see them. They've come from all the villages with their children. Sister Dorota's nursing team arrived yesterday to get everything ready. Actually, state medical aid station should take over the provision of health care. Supposed to be in our area 23 aid posts, but it's only five existing and half of them are closed yet. When we go for patrol, we only found one, one open and the fellows are not there. And because of this situation, we are trying now to organize a training. So from each village, we want to train one person, can be man or, mer or woman, and one woman for attending the village delivery. Time's short as the expensive vaccine can only be used while it's still cool. With three nurses from the medical facility at Timbunke, Sister Dorota and Sister Monica get to work in a world of heat and incessant screaming. In the country, the previous years, in the mountains, hundreds of children died, but in our area, because we immunized them good, and in time, we didn't have one death of all the children. So 
der natürlichen Medizin, die sie selber haben, weg. In addition to the natural medicine, which they've got themselves, it just needs vaccination campaigns. It needs additional medication. That's a future that we, precisely because of our European knowledge, can bring into the country and train up the locals. And in that way, can just give the people more of a future. I think every human being in this world should be able to look forward to a future where they can live, where they can get as high a quality of life as possible. Not one human being in Europe is worth more than one here. And as much as we can help them and share with them, for me it all comes down to the Christian belief that we're simply called upon to share things with each other. We travel along the Serpic and all the barrets. We stay with the people wherever the night got us, and we stay and sleep in the conditions as the people are on the floor with the limbo. Sometimes it's very hard, sometimes with the big family, no space. We stay with the people, and we stay and do the clinic next day and move to another area for one week. At the end of the week, we collect all the people, the sick one, and we return to the health center. And the team who is staying in the health center through the week will go the coming week again out for the patrol for the next week. And that we continue for six weeks to reach all the, our people in our area. Sister Dorota and her team look after 21,000 men and women in this way, spread out over an area where every kilometer of travel can become a real trial of strength. No wonder the country seemed impenetrable to the first Europeans which is why at first they established settlements primarily on the coast. Then in the 1930s, the first missionaries pushed into the mountain region, which until that time had been unexplored. The Divine Word missionary, Father Ross, was one of the first. With a modest mission station in Mount Hagen, he founded what is today the Highland Regional Capital. Bismarck Gebirge is what the Germans named the mountain range, over 4,000 meters high, which for centuries had barred the way to the highlands. Uncharted territory in Kaiser Wilhelm's land, as the German colony in the northwest of what is today Papua New Guinea was called until 1914. We're traveling with Archbishop Meyer until two years ago, the spiritual head of Mount Hagen. The smell of the charred remains of houses still hangs in the air. It's only three days ago that here, warriors from feuding tribes burnt everything to the ground. The murder of a clan member triggered a conflict that's now been going on for several days, with so far 12 dead. Here in the Highlands, tools become weapons again and again in a bloody, merciless struggle between families and tribes. With the bishop and sister Ehrentruder, we are in Paar, three hours by car from Mount Hagen. <coughs> the Austrian nun worked here for several years, and is meeting old acquaintances. As a teacher, she and her fellow nuns had to experience the butchery by the tribes at first hand. They had spears and knives and even rifles. It was terrible. All the houses here in our neighborhood were burnt down and the war itself was fought a bit further up. And early in the morning they would march up with their spears, shouting their war cry. By midday they'd be tired and have already shot someone, and then they would march back past our house, fetch water and something to drink, and then a few hours rest, and at four in the afternoon they'd start to fight again. That went on for six months like that. We were in the house and made sure nothing happened to us, and saved the house and the center. <laughs> It's meetings like these that the nuns use to try and counter the tribal feuds. Feuds which flare up again and again. 
Catechists from the surrounding area have come for a week-long course at the Par Pastoral Centre. Many of them, too, have already fought. Here they can learn that the Gospel marks out a different path. The message of Jesus has nothing to do with the principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, on which the tribal conflicts operate. Instead, reconciliation, the way out of the spiral of violence. Through their pastoral involvement, the nuns want to help reach out into the country with this core of the Christian message, for a future without violence. In our Bishops' Conference, we have said over and over again that possibly the main problem we face is the, the gap between faith and action. That we have very, very active religious life, churches are full, but there is then a big gap between that faith life and the day-to-day -day life. Uh, because we still have very high levels of domestic violence, very high levels of crime, very high levels of problems with HIV AIDS and promiscuity and marriage breakdown. So there's something not quite right. Uh, and that is why the Holy Spirit sisters have been very much involved in family life programs. In that way we would hope to reduce some of these marriage and family life problems that we face. In fact, it's very hard to imagine what our diocese would be like if the Holy Spirit Sisters had not been our co-workers for the last 60 years. Thanks a lot. You did not remind me about this this morning. I didn't know they did not The Bishop's Palace is modest. The person who runs his office, or maid of all work, as she jokingly says, is Sister Erin Truder. She knows the situation of the church in the country. She's been in Papua New Guinea for 49 years. Up until independence and the founding of the state, she worked as a teacher. Up uh, 1975 durften we Ausländer ja nicht mehr in den Schulen arbeiten, weil from 1975 on, foreigners like me were no longer allowed to work in the schools because there were enough local teachers who could take over the state schools. We saw that as a success. On the other hand, we had to look and see where we could best get involved. And I decided then to go over to pastoral work. I was then responsible for the schools, and then a role was created by the Bishops' Conference. National Christian Education Coordinator. And then I took that on as well, and the main task at the time was to produce a new series of religious books. And when that was finished, I went on to the pastoral centre at PA. And there we gave courses and wrote courses and put together books that they could use and hand out. I could really tell there we built up our own ability to influence the world in all sorts of ways. Ich habe wirklich gespürt, wir haben da unsere eigenen Kräfte vervielfältigt dadurch in, in vielerlei Weise. Sister Erin Trude lives together with an Indian, a Dutch and two local nuns in a modest house. That the women have such varied backgrounds is typical for an order that, despite its European roots, sees itself more and more as an international family. Next morning, we meet the Indian sister Diva. As the bishop's representative for health care, she is also responsible for seeing that the staff nurses are paid regularly. Our founder wanted to uh, help the women in the mission, so this was one of our priority areas uh, to take care of the mothers and the children. So uh, now the, our congregation main aim is to take care of HIV patients. Okay. Just a little prick, not very painful, but it can wreck a life, a blood test 
in the Diocesan AIDS Advice Center. Even if a positive first test result has to be checked in the lab, in most cases it shows who's carrying the virus. It takes 15 minutes for the test strip to give a result. Minutes of torturing uncertainty. In the beginning, they were throwing, uh, if they know that uh, they had this virus, they throw them out from the families. One of the worst, uh, worst experience was, like in a family, they had one person and the, the house was put on fire with a uh, with person. So that happened uh, once a year. Finally, praise the Lord, both can breathe a sigh of relief, at least for the moment. For the workers and advisors in the church's advice centre know that many come back time and again. In an area where almost 10% of the population is infected, the danger is all around you. And so the advisors never tire of explaining how you can protect yourself. The declared aim of the nuns is to cover the country with a network of advisors to finally put a stop to the deadly epidemic. We cannot do ourselves everything alone. We will include many people to fight against this disease. They are trained well. We give them instructions. We, we don't, do not have so many sisters, so we are finding out, so we promote the lay vocation, lay people to encourage them to do the work, and we, so we are happy with that. They get the support and medical support they, they need, and this is also free of charge. People don't have to pay for anything, what they come for the, the treatment. We have in all our centers, we have some rooms where people can stay overnight, especially when, uh, sometimes we have these problems uh, when women are coming in, they're po testing positive. They are very afraid to go home and tell their husbands because they'll be beaten up and all these kind of things. So they will, we have space for them to, to stay and they can stay for some days and you counsel them or you try to get somebody from the family in and explain what's happening. At first sight, a happy family, if it weren't for the AIDS virus they're all carrying. Every week they come to the centre to get their medicine, to discuss their situation with a counsellor. Even if that doesn't solve all the problems, it's more than it first seems. That they have somebody who is able to listen and to understand what is happening to them. I think it's more the value in that one is more than anything of the other financial or whatever you, you medication or whatever you can do. And we would fail, really, if we would not give our very best. Yeah, I think we just have to be there. It's the time where this is one of our priorities also from the congregation. And uh, I had the good luck and fortune to train 18 of our sisters from all over the world last year. We trained them for two and a half months and they have all gone back to Angola, Mozambique, Ghana and uh, I hear the wonderful stories now how they, how they became empowered. Der Kampf gegen AIDS. The fight against AIDS is one of the greatest challenges to which the nuns today have devoted themselves. As much as help for those directly affected is the focus of their work, 
The fight against AIDS has to, as the nuns told us over and over again, start much earlier. Best of all in the place which, along with the home, is the most important in forming their characters. And so today, the nuns again see a fruitful field of activity where they once began, in the schools. In Madang, the place where the first missionaries started work over 100 years ago, we visited Sister Teresa and her class. We were in a state school on the coast. Although the nuns had played a decisive role in shaping the school system, from 1975 onwards, they were no longer allowed, as members of a foreign order, to teach in primary schools. Not until 1984 could the order, following new church guidelines, also accept local nuns. So now we have national sisters and we would like to train them to teach in the primary school. So we have already one in Hagen and sister also sister Agnes Therese. And there are more young sisters who are willing to go into primary school teaching. So and I think that would be the best move for us so that